Hey guys, my name is Ermo, the lead content specialist behind the brand. I have mean... Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one thing the Dave Ramseys out there won't tell you. Saving is what you do if you lack financial literacy. Borrowing, investing, leveraging, these types of terms is what you do if you have higher financial literacy. We have a whole host of people who are going about their wealth plan from a place of scarcity, saving, lowering their expenses, eating cheaply, treating themselves cheaply, right? Rather than just shifting their mindset to how can I 10X my income? It was an experiential journey for me in that of going from zero dollars, right? Out of college debt to my first $10,000 a month. And then, you know, $25,000 a month, $50,000 a month, then $100,000 a month. My financial problems started to become, this is way too big of a tax bill. So 2019, I figured out how the 1% play that game. And I started to understand trust law, jurisdiction, offshore banking and offshore laws. And that was what took things just out of the stratosphere for me. As if each of you listening to this can simply write down those three levers that I just talked about and commit to mastering those three, your money problems are going to shift from, I don't have enough to, I have too much. What the hell am I gonna do with it? That is how the 1% play the game. Cheers, brother. Cheers. It's the J. Griff brand. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Ermo, the lead content specialist behind the brand. I've been meaning to ask Jeremy a couple of questions and now we finally meet in person. And what better way to do it with the cameras on and actually uh, ask him these questions. And uh, so that's what we're gonna do today. So the first question what I have is, uh, what does work-life balance look like for you? Can you share why, you, why you're asking me that? Sure. So we hear, of course, a lot of people saying like, oh, you need to have work-life balance. And I know you a little bit. Of course, I've been behind the scene. And I also know that you have a different perspective around this. So I would love to hear that. <clears throat> yeah. It's definitely a polarizing question. What I'll say in my experience is that work-life balance doesn't exist when you find your life purpose. It's probably different when you work a corporate job or you have a side gig or you're working just to provide for your family or whatever, right? I can imagine a strong likelihood that if you're in that type of situation, the main thing you care about is work-life balance. But for someone who's in a position where they're crystal clear on why they're on earth and they've also had to work years and years and years to actualize any semblance of success in their pursuits. The notion of work-life balance doesn't really make sense. The way that I live my life and the businesses that I run and the way that we have our entire, you know, wealth plan and financial reality set up, my lifestyle is synonymous with business with the brand with wealth it's not like i'm hitting record sitting behind the camera and acting or something like that like i don't genuinely eat sleep and breathe these concepts that i teach for a living so we definitely live in a world where work life balance is an extreme is a common topic that a lot of people believe in, I'd say, and we see it a lot on the internet. My perspective is just that if you know yourself, I think you, the best approach to life in general is just going to be reverse engineering your own tendencies, mindset, 
temperament, goals, and reverse engineering from that and deriving how your lifestyle is set up. And for someone like me, business, investing, the work that I do publicly, the work that I do privately, the work that I do with my team, the people that I pour into, the people that I provide for, I don't do this for the money. So I think that's a lot of what it's about is like when you're pursuing, when you're engaging in a pursuit for the result, then balance matters. But when you remove the desire for any specific result and you're just obsessed with the process, there's not really a notion of balance to me. And this also brings forth the idea that, you know, I've talked about repeatedly and me and Aaron have talked about this as well, of when you're a spiritual entrepreneur, there's this notion of you're fulfilling your dharma, you're fulfilling your life purpose through the vehicle of business and service to others. And we talked about this concept of being through doing, which is essentially, it's pretty paradoxical to wrap your <laughs> egoic mind around, but it is possible to be completely aligned completely centered, completely at peace while also working. And I think that's a big part of the discrepancy here is for a lot of people, work equals stress, unhappiness, pressure. They just don't love it, right? And so if you don't love it, you need a break from it. You need a balance. But what about the percentage of people who eat, sleep, and breathe what they do? Like if you took away the financial incentives, they would still work the same amount. That is the bucket that I'm in. And so I don't know if that's a popular answer for the, for the internet, but I wish that for everyone. I think that what's unique about the way that I live my life is my entire lifestyle is interconnected. Relationship, family, fitness and health, business, investing, law, all these things are synonymous with who I am. They're extensions of me. And so I'm really just living my ideal life and I just so happened to make an amazing living doing that. But if you took away the cameras, if you took away the financial incentives, nothing would change about how I'm living my day-to-day -day life. And so there isn't that need for balance, but there would be if I wasn't doing what I loved. So I think that's what I would say about that. Mm. And I fully agree. I mean, yesterday you showed us how you exercise and in particular PRI. Yeah. And yeah, how you are at service is, is unbelievable. It's beautiful to see. So uh, Daphne, yeah. Thank you, brother. Yep, I fucked it up. <laughs> you can't just be honest, bro. Have some integrity. <laughs> this man always says he has integrity, but he doesn't want to tell me what's up, you know. But I see it in his face. <laughs> it's just a nice way of saying like, bro, you fucked up. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't your best audition. I'll yeah, do that. okay. I'll do it one more time. Because this is the thing, if I keep repeating myself, I, I go too much in the yeah, head, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> become red, bro. Are you trying? Yeah. <laughs> Is this intentional to get a, some good B-roll for us? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's all part of the game. Yeah. Alright, let's try it one more time. Otherwise, we just... Right. <laughs> 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 I'm hot, bro. <laughs> We're gonna be hella red. I definitely need to do some uh, color grading after this. <laughs> 
Now, the second question what I have is, looking back on your journey, what did you need to master to go from in debt, living with your mom, to the financial reality that you have currently? Did this stuff come natural to you? And I'm also sure that there are viewers out there who think, oh, he must have been lucky. Um, and I'm wondering, like, what is the story behind that? So what comes to mind is actually the literal framework that we have built the entire Level Up Collective mastermind around, which consists of three financial levers. And these three levers took me 10 years to master. Lever one is cash flow. This is, are you bringing in more money than you're spending? Very simply. Lever two is velocity of money. Is your money multiplying without you trading your time for it? If you put your money if you take cash out of the bank, you stick it in a shoebox, put it under your bed. That is the slowest velocity of money possible. If you take your money, use it as collateral to take a loan out against it, use that loan to invest into something that's a highly leveraged, highly speculative product. That would be an example of some of the highest velocity of money, right? So there's an entire spectrum there. Lever three is all about taxes. The wealthy do not care how much money you make. It is a game of how much you keep. So between those three levers, cash flow, velocity of money, and taxes, it's so simple, right, when I explain it like that. But that simplicity, that level of mastery to be able to bring forth these three very simple financial concepts took me 10 years because it's not something I read in a book. It's not something I've ever heard someone bring forth and present in that way. I really had to walk this path and I had to learn this experientially. So when we talk about what Irma was asking, you know, going from in debt, living with my mom, you guys are all familiar with the story, I'm sure, to where I am today, you know, them, they've, uh, Irma has spent the week with us luxury cars, buying nice products, living in an amazing home, whatever it is, money's just no longer a driving force in my life, right? I think that's the big difference. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't rule me anymore. I, I don't make my decisions based off of money. I think that's the big difference, right? When you don't have money, most of your life decisions are filtered through the lens of, well, can I afford it, right? And then you eventually get to a point where you have enough money to where like, that's not what you're making your decisions based off of. And so I'd say <clears throat> I would humbly describe that situation is essentially where we're at in our life now. And when I think about the journey from there, you know, living with my mom to where I'm at today, it's very much so a journey of mastering those three levers. And I had to start with cash flow because number one, taxes aren't an issue when you're broke, <laughs> right? Which is why the lower and lower class and middle class, really, they don't really focus too much on tax loopholes and, and these types of things, right? They don't know anything about trust law, contract law, jurisdictions, offshore banking. They don't understand this stuff. And then even velocity of money, that last word, money, <laughs> That's the bottleneck, right? Who cares about the velocity of money if you don't have money to start with? So you really have to start with cash flow. So the first few, let's say, man, I mean, I started at 20, starting out, trying my first business. I really didn't crack the code <clears throat> until 25, 26. And it really didn't fully actualize in my life until... 
27, 28. It's a long time. I was just focusing on one lever. Cash flow. Because here's one thing the Dave Ramsey's out there won't tell you. You can only lower your expenses so much. But there is no cap to how much you can increase your income. So we have a, a whole host of people who are going about their wealth plan from a place of scarcity, saving, lowering their expenses, selling things, eating cheaply, treating themselves cheaply, right? Rather than just shifting their mindset to how can I 10x my income to where these expenses are literally frivolous? They don't even matter. That was what I focused on for six, seven years, just solely focusing on that. And I happened to do that. Everyone's journey is different, but I did that through the vehicle of entrepreneurship. You guys should know I've, I'm on my you know fourth business. And so it was a, it was an experiential journey for me in that of, you know, going from zero dollars, right? Out of college debt to my first $5,000 a month to my first $10,000 a month. Wow. That one was probably one of the sweetest feelings was that $10,000 a month because it just seemed like so much money at that time, you know? And then, you know, $25,000 a month and then a $50,000 a month and then $100,000 a month, and on and on. That cash flow piece is everything. But I want to clarify, cash flow is just one lever. You need all three if you really want to master the game of commerce and wealth. So lever two, once you're starting to bring in cash flow, is velocity of money. It's not enough to simply make more money because if you have to trade any semblance of your time to make that money, then you will forever be a slave to whatever that vehicle is. And the whole point of money is to make it a servant of you, not to be a servant of it. So the goal is to take your excess cash flow and funnel it into the right investments that multiply without your time needing to be traded for it. So that's piece two of the financial levers. And I really didn't start investing seriously until I was 26. So from 20 to 26 was just building business, figuring it out because I sucked in the beginning. And when I started to pay off all of my debt, pay off my first car in full. Holy shit. Now every dollar I make, it's actually mine, right? Because before that, it was just going to debt. Not a good feeling. Now it was like, okay, I'm saving up, saving up, saving up. What am I going to do with this money? I need to multiply it. So that was when my focus shifted a little bit to, okay, before I was solely focusing on entrepreneurship. Now let's take it to the next level. Phase two of my plan. We've worked really hard to get here. Let's take things to the next level with phase two. And it was like, okay, who do I need to hire? What uh, courses do I need to take? What rooms do I need to get in? What masterminds do I need to surround myself with to figure out this investing piece from people who are doing it at a level I want to learn to do it at? So that was that next piece, 26, 27, 28. And then 2020 came, the most exponential financial year of uh, my investing life. And that was just absolutely ridiculous leap in wealth, right? And right around that time, 2019, 2020, I started to shift financial timelines to such a degree that my financial uh, problems were no longer, shit, I'm starting to make some money and I'm afraid it's going to go away. Or shit, I can't afford this. How do I make more money? Or whatever. That Those are most people's financial problems, right? My financial problems started to become, this is way too big of a tax bill. I can't deal with this. This is, uh, this is my top priority problem that I need to solve. So 2019, I figured out how the 1% play that game. 
and I finally found the right mentor, the right access to information, and I started to understand trust law. I started to understand jurisdiction. I started to understand offshore banking and offshore laws. And I started to understand commerce at a deeper level. And that was what took things just out of the stratosphere for me. And then we have 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and now we're in 2024. And so it's been four-ish years of having all three pieces in place, cash flow, on point, growing, velocity of money, always many streams of income, different asset allocations, different asset classes, different risk levels, et cetera. And the tax piece solved. That is how the 1% play the game. And I couldn't find someone to show me that. No one would spill the beans, right? They don't like to tell their secrets. So I really had to, as they say, get it out the mud. I had to figure this out through trial and error and a lot of just pushing forward through fear and resistance because a lot of this stuff feels like you're doing something wrong or scary or you could lose a lot of money or whatever, right? So that's what my journey has been like. And that is why I'm so incredibly passionate about what we're doing in the Level Up Collective and with the brand as a whole. Because if each of you listening to this can simply write down those three levers that I just talked about and commit the next five, 10 years of your life to mastering those three, your money problems are going to shift from I don't have enough to I have too much. What the hell am I going to do with it? And that is something that I wish for all of you. That is the whole point of the service to others path. You need money for that. As I'm always saying, I hope I sound like a broken record at this point talking about how I don't care how spiritual you are or how well-intentioned your mission is for humanity and what you want to give back, you need money for that. And these three levers are how you get there and how I personally got there. Wow. That's a very in-depth and, and amazing answer that gave a lot of clarity to me. I appreciate you sharing that with us. But I do have an additional question for that, and that's how can one master those like in my position like how can i actually start mastering those leverage where you're talking about yeah yeah i'm glad you're kind of digging deeper on this because i just you know that was a lot yeah. that i just said so let's go piece by piece yeah so let's start with the cash flow cash flow is debatably the most important piece because if you don't master that piece, the other two, they don't really matter, do they? If you're poor, you don't have anything to invest. There's no need to learn that. If you're poor, the government doesn't really tax you. Mm. They might give you money back. Yeah. <laughs> they pay you to be poor, just so you guys know. They will pay you to be poor. They want that. So that doesn't matter either. So cash flow is the crux for most people, which by the way, is why we have the Aligned mm. Entrepreneur Academy program because that is all about creating cash flow in a conscious way and learning to be of service in a capitalistic system without sacrificing mm -hmm. your soul, your morals and all that. Yeah. So the cash flow conundrum or dilemma, right, can be solved one of two ways. And we're going to come back to self-awareness again. Not everyone needs to be or should be an entrepreneur. I'm a firm believer in entrepreneurial values, mm. mindset, work ethic, passion, creativity, all things that you have in spades. But not everyone wants or needs to create their own business. So the way I see this is twofold. Solving the cash flow problem either looks like plugging yourself into a company, ideally more of a startup, a small business, and reverse engineering how you can bring in a substantial amount of increased revenue to that business. And if you can do that, you deserve a cut of that, don't you? And this is exactly how 
I run my business, isn't it? Correct. And so the way that I position each of you in the business is I let you know, here's the area of the business. Here's the lever or the the kind of uh, KPI or the metric that your kind of, that your role is tied to. The better you can help increase this little KPI in the company, we're going to reward you substantially in addition to salary or whatever it may mm-hmm. be, right? Yeah. So one aspect of it is being what's called an intrapreneur, which is what you are and what everyone in our team is. We don't have payroll. We don't have payroll taxes. We don't have employees. I address everyone as equals in this company. And everyone's essentially an independent contractor. We're more so partnering on the same mission than we are like boss and everyone else here, right? So what I require of you guys is a lot more than a typical like clock in, clock out employee, right? Because you guys are intrapreneurs. But the benefit of that is that you're going to be able to make a lot more cash flow than if you were to go get a job at Amazon, go get a job at Microsoft, go get a job, go get a sales job or what, you know what I mean? Mm. So that's piece one of like specific to someone like yourself who has a, they already have a high level skill set. You have a creative genius that allowed you to beat out over a hundred other applicants to get this position. And so that is your ticket. Lean into that, right? And I don't need to tell you that. You're already doing that. We already talk about this off camera. But essentially, it's like you came into the company, you're paying your dues, and your growth pathway is very clear, right? You have a clear path to six figures and beyond. And that is, in my opinion, your ticket, assuming you don't want to go build your own business. And after seeing the behind the scenes of what goes into it, I think you quickly get an idea of, is that for you or not? You know, it's not for everyone, is it? (laughs) No, it's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. And um, and earlier on, I was a little more naive to thinking, oh, everyone should be an entrepreneur. No one should. Mm. And it's like "Mm, there's definitely uh, we're all playing our part. Right. It's a lot of stress. It's uh, 24 seven. You don't really get to turn off, you know. So that's for anyone listening who might be more like you have a set skill, ideally a high value skill, right? It's not like, oh, I can draw cool cartoons. Okay. I don't know where that fits you in, in business, but you know, uh, uh, sales, marketing, copywriting, branding, you're good at communication. You're good at systems, technology, client fulfillment. You can code, you can do websites, social media management. Like all of these are high value skills, right? That's that piece. If not, the other piece of cash flow is obviously building your own business. Now, with building your business, the blessing and the curse is that you can make, there is zero limit to what you can make, right? Whereas within a company, there is a limit to what you can make because obviously no team member can exceed uh, the revenue of the company. So already there's a constraint there, albeit ideally it's a still a huge growth trajectory, but there is still a constraint there. Mm. Whereas in business, there is no constraint, right? You can theoretically make as much money as you can create value that is well enough that people want to pay you for it. But with business, that's the upside. But what's the downside? The part that people don't want to hear about the cash flow equation. Well, what if I told you it will take you five years? How would you feel about it then? And to clarify further, not take you five years to reach financial freedom. Take you five years to hit your first $10,000 a month. All of a sudden, the whole working a job thing, you're going to hit that way faster, working in an organization. So that's an interesting, I guess, part of my own evolution is I used to be so, I guess, contrarian and anti-authority that I'm just like, no one should have a job, this type of thing. But I think if you can find an environment where it doesn't feel like a job, where you're not treated like, you know, just an employee and there's that aspect of, of unity, connection, community, and, and a shared mission, 
that is probably going to be the quicker and more certain bet to getting to a six figure and beyond income consistently. Whereas in business, it's just, it all comes back to self-awareness. Mm. And this is why I'm, we're very clear on like, not everyone should be an entrepreneur. If, if in your peer group, people don't repeatedly like reflect back to you that like, you're like special, whether that's like, wow, you're smart or like, wow, you have an excellent ability to communicate or like, wow, you have a incredible skill set in blank area. If you're average, and I know that's hard to say because probably most of us perceive ourselves like as we're so special, <laughs> sure. but maybe take an IQ test and an EQ test and a personality test and like go, I don't know, <laughs> do some of these things to see where you rank, right? Uh, if you're average, like business probably isn't for you because you have to not only be gifted, but you have to be willing to outwork the competition. Mm. And that's not always fun. Not always fun at all. So those are the two pieces of the cash flow aspect of that is like you have to at least be able to get to like six figures, right? Mm. Because let's say, let's say those of you watching this or yourself, you, you can manage to keep your lifestyle expenses at, well, for it's different because you're overseas, but let's say for Americans, you can manage to keep your lifestyle expenses at $5,000 a month or less for the next five years. And you can make $10,000 a month for the next five years. That's a net positive cash flow of $5,000 a month after all everything's paid for, even like your some of your discretionary spending to have fun and these types of things. That's $5,000 a month that can go straight into investment accounts. Mm. That's $60,000 a year times five. That's $300,000 over five years. In the investments that we teach, <laughs> the average ROI a year is, let's say, 50 to 100%. Yeah. So I can't do the math on that off the top of my head because it's compounding math. It's not like we would take 300,000 and double it, right? Mm -hmm. 50, then that would double. Then you would add a new 50, then that would double. So I would have to use a complex calculator. But let's just say that would put this person close to a mil in five years. And they're just making $10,000 a month. Yeah. So it's not complicated, but it is difficult. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're humans. Mm -hmm. We're emotional creatures. What I just said might have some of you fired the fuck up right now. And in a matter of three hours, you're going to already be back in your normal brain state, totally having moved, moved on with your life and nothing will have changed. This is what we're up against as humans. Mm. So that's piece one is the, is the cash flow piece, right? Of like exactly how do you do that? Then obviously the investing piece, once you start to make more than you spend consistently, like once you cross the threshold where you're like every month I have savings, perfect. Now your job is you shouldn't have savings. I don't mean you shouldn't have some, you know, some rainy day, some emergency fund. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it is not a financial wealth strategy to save money. The wealthy don't do that. <laughs> the wealthy not only don't save money, they leverage other people's money who save their money and they take it from them, pay interest happily because their financial literacy is so much greater than the saver's financial literacy. Saving is what you do if you lack financial literacy. Borrowing, investing, leveraging, these types of terms is what you do if you have higher financial literacy. So I kind of view it like a stepladder, right? For, for a while, you just, you need to figure out what skills do I need to develop? What environment, company, culture, whatever do I need to plug myself into to make this happen? And or if you have the chops, the mindset and the drive, what business do I need to start to, you know, make this happen, get mm -hmm. myself to six figures and, and beyond? And then from there, it's okay. Can I delay gratification? 
Mm. Can I not have to keep up with the Joneses and upgrade my cars and have multiple leases and have a mortgage that's out of out of what I should be spending right now and going to dinners that I don't necessarily need mm. to impress people that I don't actually care about? And do I need to go on these three vacations this year? And that's where the inner work comes in, right? Why am I doing this? Why am I a prisoner to what society says I should do? That's a piece of it. And then when you start to solve that and you have, you know, a few thousand a month that you're able to save, that starts to really compound, right? Especially when you don't just put it in a bank to sit there, especially when you multiply it, right? Then eventually the taxes piece matters because as you start to get into the six, multiple six figure range, your taxes start to become $50,000. Yeah. $100,000. Do you know the opportunity cost of that? It is not just the $50,000 check you had to write to the IRS. It is the opportunity cost of what that would have turned into if you put that in Bitcoin at 15000 mm. and Bitcoin's at 85000 right now. Mm. That's more like $400,000. And so this is the way you want to be thinking about it. And that's why everything always comes back to these three levers. Mm. So hopefully that kind of clarifies things a little bit more. Wow, I really feel that. And in particular, being here for one week, I see it actually up close. You are like a real humble man. I mean, you showed us around. And as I also mentioned before, you showed us certain exercises and were really just helping us out. And you're just not like an, so to say, sleazy scumbag. Right, you're actually... <laughs> Thanks, Armand. Yeah, bro, no, but for real, I mean this, because, you know, like, I unconsciously still had that image of, like, wealthy people, you know, just want to show off. And, yep. and, and you see that so much online. And, of course, yes, yesterday we rented the Rolls Royce. And, and, you know, a lot of people will think that way. But your intention behind this is completely different and i also noticed that you did this for us and and, and that's what's so beautiful for me because yesterday when i was driving at rolls royce for the first time well not only in the rolls royce but i really feel wealth yes and i think that feeling is extremely important as we know you know if we do visualizations it's all great to visualize it but at the end of the day it is about that feeling and I thank you for that, for us giving that opportunity to us, because now I just know how it feels and I am 100% sure that it's going to be a reality for me sooner or later. Um, and yeah, and I appreciate that, man. Beautiful, brother. Yeah, there's a lot that the uh, internet doesn't see and I'm, I'm sure a certain type of person will look at the, uh, some of the content that we shot this week and make snapshot judgments, but they have no, no context of behind the scenes, what we're actually doing. And I think I'm just as passionate in this season of my life. My passion has shifted from just pouring all I can into my students to try to impact them, their families and, and outwards from there, their communities and everything. It, it was solely that for a long time. Mm. And now I'm blessed to be in a position where we have a quickly growing team. Mm. And I feel like this next level of uh, service and ability to really impact change. And so it's been, it's been really cool to facilitate certain experiences for you guys and pour into you guys in a way that isn't possible through a computer screen, allowing you to have these in-person experiences and actually get to touch a Rolls Royce, drive a Rolls Royce, be driven around in a Maserati, go to dinner somewhere where there's nothing cheaper than $100 on the menu. These types of experiences until sooner or later you guys are going to, to normalize this. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm also... And it's also really helpful to see someone whom you actually know, trust, and resonate with has this life. Because I think a lot of us, like you mentioned, 
look at wealthy people and they go and we we create stories about them like oh well they're they're bad people they're greedy they're selfish they have all these negative habits or whatever so i don't want that Mm. but when you can be someone of service when you can live your life for something greater than yourself and have a connection to god when you can have a strong family unit when you can be a selfless person and have a lot of money that is something that i'm not only wanting to create in the brand and hopefully convey for you guys watching but is also something that i am really glad that you guys are getting to see this week where it's like you don't have to sacrifice your morals your integrity the things that you believe in your humility to build a wealthy life for yourself. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. And that's, I think also why I'm so drawn towards this life. Um, Also how you live here. It's, it's such a beautiful place, but you being with Jax and, and, and just how you hosted us throughout the week. It's like, you know, friends like friendships and and as you said before like a brother we've been laughing so much uh, in the gym and 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 it's just so beautiful to see because yeah unconsciously unconsciously that was probably also a fear for me right for growth to actually create financial freedom it's like maybe i'm afraid to end up that being that guy standing in front of the lambo and only showing off or you know what i mean like and his and, girlfriend hates him and his Kids don't want to talk to him. Exactly. And everyone describes him as a dick. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. See, so, and, and, and I appreciate you um, yeah, shifting almost my identity in towards, in towards that. So it's amazing. It's beautiful. So do we have any, uh, any last words you want to share before we, before we wrap this up for the people? Yeah. So now I have... Because I'm part of the team, I, of course, see also what is happening, uh, in particular in the LUC, uh, how this community is thriving, and also what Jeremy mentioned, like, you know, there's, there's well, a shortcut, maybe you can call it a shortcut, is, of course, being surrounded by the right people. And what I've been seeing in the LUC, how you are helping people and people to level up in all aspects of life is is extremely valuable. Uh, and also for that, I'm grateful that I can be part of this. And so I think for you guys, if you're watching this, grab the chance, right? Of course, the, the level of collective is, is also a container and there's only a certain amount of people who can go in there. But if you feel now like I am done with living this life or i've been trying for so many years to get out of this red race maybe this is your golden ticket because at least it's for me you know of course i consider myself lucky to actually be with the man himself over here but if you can take that shortcut but being in a community and actually also being close up with jeremy in that way online i think that is a massive opportunity um so my final words are that like like check at least out uh, what the level up collective can provide or even the other programs um, and have a chat have a chat with our team and um, see if you're the right fit for us before we wrap up because of the nature of how this video went i already know a percentage of people are going to think that this was some uh, carefully crafted angle that i uh, set up for us to film and I told you to say these things and all that. So can you answer uh, for the people whose, whose idea was this video? Completely mine. Completely mine. Yeah. Whose idea were the questions? Mine. Whose idea was pitching the level up collective? Mine. (laughs) Yeah. And maybe it's important for them to understand like, why, why were these your ideas? why did you feel it's important to share this with with them Hmm. that's a good question i think because i am still not where you are 
and of course I want to reach that uh, maybe in particular my financial situation and I see I've seen it you know I've, I'm already there I can see behind the screen what's going on I've been living with you I know it's not some BS it's like it's pure integrity and exactly what you mentioned, what you've been doing the first five years, I've been doing this also in my life for a long time. You know, I had my own businesses and all that stuff, but I've been trying and kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall where now I finally feel I'm climbing out of this puddle. And I know that, <clears throat> I know that there's just no better way than to do it with a community who all want you to level up. And that's why... I felt the need to actually sit down with Jeremy and get to know him also more maybe on a personal level because that's not always what you see, right? Like we're, we're pretty good in cinematography and he's an amazing teacher. Um, but, you know, just actually having a conversation like this, like this, you could be me right now probably, yeah, makes a difference. Um, and that's why I wanted to do this. That's That's the main reason, to make you... Yeah, more humane, I'd say. Yeah. And would you say that I'm more or less uh, serious and relatable than you thought based on my content? No, bro. Not at all. <laughs> we got to put some clips in here probably where we had some laughs, you know, like even before we started this. Like, nah, not at all. <laughs> bro, bro, I thought it was pretty solid, dog. <laughs> we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna have bloopers for days bro what, uh, what? let's just start with... <laughs> see so, so this is why i'm behind the camera <laughs> this is the reason yeah, you, it... you decide maybe you guys think it's good maybe we should put a poll up <laughs> let's pull a poll I up i think it's just a difference of like uh well, English isn't your first language, right? Exactly. No. <laughs> you know that too, no. <laughs> no, that's the whole issue. Yeah, I'm, I know, like, when I explain things, it's way shorter. Like, I don't, for me, it's very difficult to, I'm speaking three languages, you know, but to go in depth and yeah. unpack is, is difficult, you know, so I always go to the point. So. Like, from the beginning, when I arrived, you are you're such a dude, <laughs> you know, you're, you're just a bro. And we had so many laughs and yeah, you're a joker, really. Like, and I think that's also important for the audience to know because you don't always see this, you know, you yeah. have to, of course, you have to be in that role because you have a very They're important serious mission. serious topics. Yeah, bro. Like yeah. you have an important mission. And as you said, it's your dharma and you should never leave this behind. Uh, because you're changing a whole lot of lives. But yes, it's very important that you ask this question because I do think there's a chance that a lot of people don't take this first step to maybe jump on board because they almost feel like... Intimidated. Exactly. Exactly that. Would you say I'm intimidating in person? Maybe when you hit the gym. And you <laughs> say, <"Okay." laughs> he had to think twice. <laughs> When this I dude. took when I took my jacket off, yeah, bro, pumping some iron in the gym. I like, <laughs> yeah, no, I have to admit that was quite intimidating. But overall, but in a, in a mentorship sense, in a setting like this, when no. uh, when we're hanging out and the cameras are off, not at all, no, not at all. You're you're. A, I really feel with you that I can ask anything, and and that's very important because if I have a feeling that you might think that I'm asking a stupid question yep. or there's no resonance, yep. then it's it doesn't work for me. Yep. Because I had my own mentors in the past and I consider you also as a mentor, mentor even if I'm you know working also for the brand. Um, but there's this yeah resonance and, and so I don't feel that at all, no. Beautiful. Well, there you have it, folks. Straight from someone other than my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't know I was going to ask him those things either. So uh, a bit sweaty now. but Yeah. <laughs> now, this was beautiful. Uh, honestly, this was um, actually my favorite video wow. that we filmed all week. I really liked this and uh, the authenticity. So 
Shout out to Irmo, guys. Leave us a comment below if you appreciated this kind of unique, candid, conversational style edit. And um, also let us know below if you want to see more content like this where you're able to see members who are typically behind the scenes. Maybe bring them bring them on and we have conversations so that you guys can maybe see different different aspects of things that you just aren't able to see being only watching from the internet, if you will. So, Irma, my man, appreciate you, brother. Thanks, brother. It was Your amazing. brother. Cheers. It's been a fun week. All right, we'll see you guys in the next video. Peace and love. Peace.